Hello, I'm Nicholas Cohen, a third year family medicine resident at University Hospital's Case Medical Center. I'm also a registered diagnostic medical sonographer and a registered diagnostic cardiac sonographer. This module is the first in a series of modules for limited obstetrical ultrasound. As part of the Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Resource, presented by the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine and the Association of Family Medicine Residency Directors. I had helped putting this module together from Dr. Justin Lappin, Dr. Quinlan, and Dr. Stevens. This module is focused on ultrasound physics and instrumentation. Ultrasound is defined as sound that is of a frequency too high to be heard by a normal human ear. And that frequency has determined to be 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. Ultrasound that's used for imaging is created by a piezoelectric crystal. A piezoelectric crystal is basically a substance that when electricity is applied to it creates a sound wave. The sound wave is emitted or sent out from the transducer. It encounters tissue and is reflected back to the transducer. The reflected returning echoes are what creates the image on the screen. When sound waves encounter tissue, one of two things can happen. The sound waves can be transmitted through the tissue or can be reflected back from the tissue. What happens depends on whether there's a change in density of the substance that the sound wave is passing through. If there's no change in density, the sound wave is transmitted. If there is a change in density, the sound wave is reflected. The percentage that the, that the sound wave is reflected is determined by the difference in the density of the two tissues. So if you have two tissues that are extremely different densities, you'll have a high reflection. So if you look at this image right here, which is of the fetus, there's a high reflection at the surface where the probe interacts with, with the skin. There's also a high reflection between the amniotic fluid and the skull. The difference between the fluid and the skull, the difference in density is great. So there's a significant amount of brightness or reflection that occurs at that interface. The reason we use gel when we're doing ultrasound is to decrease the reflection that occurs when the sound waves leave the transducer and pass through the air into the skin. Air and skin, that interface is extremely differing densities. Obviously the air is a lot lo lower density, so there's a lot of reflection that occurs unless we can eliminate the air that is, would otherwise be between the probe and the skin. Attenuation is a property of tissues, and it causes a decrease in the power or the amplitude of the sound waves as it travels through tissue. The more that the, the further the sound waves travels, the more the sound wave attenuates. And the more the sound wave attenu attenuates, the less bright the image becomes. So you can see in this image right here of the human body, the tissue is bright, it's brighter towards the probe. The probe is here. As we go further away from the probe, the tissue gets darker in appearance. That's because sound waves are attenuating as they travel through the tissue. Differing tissues have differing, differing amounts of attenuation. Air will attenuate the most. Again, a reason why we use gel to eliminate air from tr from part of the path that the sound wave has to travel in. And water attenuates sound waves the least. Clinical ultrasound uses a variety of fre frequencies to create images. The range of frequencies is typically between 1 and 20 megahertz. The most common range is between 2 and 10 megahertz. 
The higher the frequency of the probe used, the greater the resolution of the image created. However, the trade-off is that the higher the frequency of the probe used, used, the less depth the sound waves can penetrate into the tissue. You can see in this image here, this is a parasternal short axis view of the heart's left ventricle taken with two different frequency probes. This is a 3 megahertz probe and this is a 5 megahertz probe. The 3 megahertz probe has not as good image resolution as the 5 megahertz probe. There are typically three categories of frequencies for ultrasound imaging. Low frequency, intermediate, and high frequency probes. Low frequency probes, typically in the range of 2 or 3 to 5 or 3.5 to 5 megahertz, are typically used when you need to image deeper, such as for transthoracic, abdominal, and pelvic imaging. Intermediate frequency probes, typically in the range of 5 to 7.5, are most commonly used with transesophageal probes for cardiac imaging. Higher frequency probes, specifically 7.5 to 10 megahertz, are used when you don't need to image deep, but, you, but, but, but uh, high resolution is important such as for musculoskeletal applications and for vascular applications. When we describe the image created by ultrasound, we refer to a structure's echogenicity. Echogenicity is the brightness of the structure that's produced. The more that the sound waves are reflected back from the tissue, the brighter the image created. We describe images in relation to their surroundings. This image, which is brighter than its surroundings, is hyperechoic. This image, which is darker than its surroundings, is hypoechoic. This image, which is the same color as the surrounding tissue, is called isoechoic, or the same echogenicity. And this image is lacks any echoes at all. It's black, and so we call it anechoic, or without echoes. There are two types of transducers when using ultrasound for clinical imaging. They are the linear probe and the convex probe. The linear probe is here, and the convex probe is here. The convex probe is also called a sector probe. The linear probe, you can see here, is flat on its footprint, and its footprint is larger than the convex probe, which means that it takes up more of surface area on the skin when it contacts the skin. Typically, linear probes are higher frequency. The image that they produce is a rectangular shape, and they are better for vascular imaging and musculoskeletal imaging. Demonstrated in this picture is ultrasound-guided cannulation of the internal jugular vein. The other type of probe, sector or convex probe, has a smaller footprint. Typically, it uses a lower frequency, and the image that's created, instead of being rectangular, like the linear probe, is a pie-shaped or sector-shaped image. The, trans, the convex probe is better for abdominal, obstetric, and cardiac imaging, where for cardiac imaging you need a smaller footprint, as well as for abdominal and obstetric where you need to be able to image deeper. There are different display modes. The three that are most relevant to our applications are B mode, M mode, and Doppler mode. B mode, or brightness mode, is typically what you think of when you think of ultrasound imaging. It's two-dimensional imaging that shows a structure's anatomy. M mode, or motion mode, provides a one-dimensional image. Here you can see a parasternal long axis view of the heart. 
This is the 2D image. Here is the M mode image. The M mode image is taking only one line. It's taking just one line straight down through the heart on the Y axis. This would be the depth of that line. And the X axis is time. So particularly here at the aortic valve, it's showing you the opening and closing of valves in, in, the, in relationship to time as time progresses. M mode is particularly good for obstetric imaging when you're calculating the fetal heart rate. It's also good whenever you're measuring something that needs to be done precisely in relation to time, particularly heart valves in cardiac imaging. Doppler mode is the third display mode we'll discuss. Doppler mode measures motion through vessels. And Doppler gives you both information about the direction of flow as well as the velocity of flow. It's important to note that red does not mean artery and blue vein. Instead, you look to your color map when you're using Doppler and it will tell you the direction of flow as well as the velocity. Using this color map, anything above the middle line is flow towards the probe. Anything below the middle line is the color representing flow away from the probe. So here's where the, this is the top of the, um, the top of the image is closest to the probe and the bottom of the image is furthest away from the probe. As we look at this image here, we see red. We look to our color map and we can tell that this is flow going towards the probe. When we look at this flow, we look at our color map and we see that this blue is the color that's below the middle line. So we know that this is flow away from the probe. Furthermore, we have a velocity map, which is the further we go from that middle line, the faster the color, the corresponding color is, is the, an increasing velocity. So in this color map, as we go from red to yellow, we go from slower to faster velocity. When we go from blue to white, we go from slower to faster velocity. So in this particular image, where we have flow going towards the transducer, the yellow in the middle represents faster flow than the flow towards the outer aspect of the vessel, which would be slower. Artifacts are anything that appear in the image that do not have corresponding anatomy in the tissue being examined. The most common types of artifacts, and the ones we'll discuss, are shadowing, comet tail or ring down, reverberations, enhancement, and mirror image. Shadowing can be seen here. This is a gallbladder and this is a gallstone. Shadowing occurs when sound hits a very reflective surface. There is little sound transmitted through the stone. So below or deep to the stone, there's a very little sound that propagates. And so very, it's, it, this structure, th the area below the hyperchoic area is hypoechoic to surrounding tissue. In comet tail or ring down artifact, again, we have a highly reflective surface. And because of the highly reflective surface, we actually have a acceleration of the velocity of sound at that interface. And that acceleration causes a hyperechoic streak, or what's called a comet tail, or ring down artifact. In our next artifact, we have what's called a reverberation. Reverberations occur when we have two highly reflective structures. The sound waves basically ping pong back and forth between the two highly reflective structures and you get a series of lines that are equally spaced apart. They are referred to or commonly described as ladder-like or 
Venetian blind in appearance. Next we have enhancement. Enhancement occurs when we have a structure that has weak attenuation. So if we have a fluid filled structure or a cyst, we have sound that's able to speed through this area. So there's very little reflection going on here. That means that sound that reaches the distal area behind this cystic or hollow structure has an increased intensity and so appears hyperechoic compared to surrounding tissue. A mirror image artifact is created when we have a strong reflector. Here's our strong reflector. The strong reflector creates a second copy of the anatomy. The second copy is always in line with the ultrasound beam and it's always deep to or further away from the probe than the actual anatomy. It's also always equidistant from the reflector as the actual anatomy. Next, we're going to discuss bioeffects. Ultrasound is safe. There's never been documented any human harm caused by ultrasound for diagnostic purposes. It's important to keep in mind that there is a theoretical risk to ultrasound. And the theoretical risk is due to the heat that's produced by the probe. The heat that's produced by the probe is described using units called the thermal index. The thermal index describes in a unit of measure how much the probe raises the tissue that's being examined by degrees Celsius. So a thermal index of one means that the exam raises the tissue by one degree Celsius. There's a theoretical risk to using ultrasound during gestation on a fetus at the, when the thermal index is greater than 1.5 to 2. The only way that a thermal index can reach that level, the only way that that much heat can be produced by an ultrasound probe is using Doppler and using Doppler for an extended period of time. And the only vulnerable time during gestation is the first trimester. So there's a particularly concerning risk for ultrasound that's used in the first trimester and when Doppler is the imaging modality. That's a reason why Doppler is avoided in first trimester scanning. Lastly, we have a concept called Alera, as low as reasonably achievable, which means that we limit the use of ultrasound to only what is necessary to produce useful images for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes.